John chapter 17. All right, John 17. And uh, we're, we weren't here last week, so we're going to just go back up in verse 11, pick up where we were, and read down through and see what uh, we're uh, uh, kind of just re- get back in our mindset here. Verse 11, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep thou keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. So again, he's talking here about the, the little flock. He's leaving. He's going to the Father. He invokes that Holy Father. That we talked about that, I know. That the name, his, his holiness, the, that attribute there, um, his holiness or integrity is really made up of two of two of his attributes, which is his one is his righteousness, and the other one is his justice. So his righteousness and his justice make up his holiness. Uh, righteousness that's the standard by which he judges things. He'll say that we need to have perfect righteousness. Well, it's his righteousness that's perfect. His justice comes along and enforces the standard. So if the standard is perfect perfection, then his justice comes along and says, you don't have it, you're guilty. You have it, you're good to go. So that makes up that holy name, the Holy Father. Uh, the, he's the righteous one, the one who can enforce and hold the standard. So therefore, and there he can keep them. And again, it's Holy Father, keep through thine own name, that, that Jehovah name. And, and the Jehovah fits all the Godhead, and we've looked at that in the past. And, and, and again, uh, we were talking last night at the study down in Queen Creek, and we were there till 11 o'clock last night. So uh, it, we, we uh, had Q&A evening, and we started at 7, and we just get rolling and but the Jehovah name, I am, fill in the blank. Look over at Acts 9. It's something very interesting. Look at Acts 9. We, we were looking at this last night. Look at Acts 9, where the Lord meets Saul of Tarsus on the road, and he says to him, verse 5, the end of verse 4, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Verse 5, and he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am who? Jesus. That's the first time in Scripture where the I am is completed. It's not left blank. It's not a Jehovah compound out. It's I am Jesus. And it's right there. Well, who's he talking to? Paul, who does what? Completes the revelation. He completes the statement about who the I am is. So in John 17, verse 12, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Again, that name of uh, of Jehovah. I kept them. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. And, And again, I kept them, All those that you gave me, I kept them, and I didn't lose any of them. And we lost Judas, but Judas really wasn't one of us to begin with. And it's interesting, even amongst the apostles, there was a mixed multitude. There wasn't just a pure, just there, there was mixed. The question then is why did he lose Judas? Well, verse 12 tells you that the scriptures might be fulfilled. So as he continues to pray for them in his presence, and then when we get down into verse 20 and following or so forth, he's going to pray for the folks coming in the, in the Acts 1 period. He says, Father, I'm turning them over to you. I'm coming to see you. I'm turning them over. They're yours. You keep them. Keep them. And I kept them while I was here. Now I'm leaving. And you're going to, it's your turn. Now, 17, 13. And now come I to thee, and these things I speak in the world, 
that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. My joy. Now, again, he's already talked to them about this, having his peace. And, have, and if you drop down there to verse 24. Oh, it's not 24. Never mind. He's already talked to them about having his, having his peace, his love. Now here it's going to be his joy. Verse 24. Father, I will that thou also whom thou hast given me be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory. So you've got my peace, my love, my joy, my glory. All that he is, is going to be given to them as an inheritance. Here in verse 13, it's about his joy. And the little, the, uh, them, I, I want them Keep them. Now I'm coming to thee, these things that I speak, that they, the little flock, the twelve apostles, might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Now, that joy there is not a joy based on the circumstances. Where is he going? He's going to go die. It's that thing in Hebrews 12 where he says, For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. So it's not a joy from the circumstances, Hebrews 12, 2, if you're writing notes, I see. So it's really the joy of a future prospect, a future situation. What's coming? The kingdom's coming. They're going to ask him in Acts 1, is it time to restore again the kingdom to Israel? The kingdom is coming. So they're looking forward to that. So the joy isn't in the moment but rather the joy is coming out over there. If you look at Hebrews 12, in verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. What was, setting, what was the joy that he was looking for? Sitting down at the right hand of, of God on the throne room, the kingdom. So he endured the situation, and that's what's coming their way back here in chapter 17. Now, Father, I'm coming to see you. We're coming your way. I want you going to keep them. We're going to put them in your name. You're going to keep them. And I want my joy, the joy that I have in that future purpose of, of your purpose, Father, to be theirs. Verse 14, 17, 14. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Now, he said this to him again. You know, he's, he's repeating himself, but there's an issue here that he's driving home. Come over to eight, chapter 18 and verse 36. This is the idea. Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews? But now is my kingdom not from hence. He's not a part of the world system. So back in 1714, I'm not a part of the world system. By the way, I'm not even praying for the world system. He's already said that. I'm praying for them, not the world nor are the little flock a part of the world. He has removed them from that realm of authority of the world over them. So the world doesn't love you. Well, why doesn't it love you? Because you're not of the world. You're, you've been removed from that. That's why they, back in chapter 15, in verse 25, at the end of that verse, they hated me without a cause. They hate them without a cause. There's no reason for them to hate. And yet, what's happened? He's removed them. He's pulled them back. So then they are not of the world. They don't belong to the world. They belong to the Godhead. 17.15 I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world but thou, thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Now, that's usually what we want, is to be taken out of the world. 
You know, I, I was thinking about this the other day. Paul never uses the rapture as an escapism issue. Rather, Acts 14, verse 22, he tells us that through much tribulation, we, um, we have to endure much tribulation to get into the kingdom of God. He doesn't say, Here, here's your escape, have the rapture come. No, you're to go through things. You're to live. So, so these guys, they're, on, they're in the world, but what are they there to do? They're there to represent him. They become his witnesses. And so he's not praying that they would leave the world. He's not looking at them saying, okay, Father, rapture them out. But rather, Father, keep them from the evil that's in the world. That, come over to Matthew chapter 6. That brings into mind Matthew 6 where he's teaching them to pray in the so-called Our Father's Prayer. Matthew 6 verse 9. He says, After this manner, therefore, pray ye. Now he's just told them, don't pray, verse 7, don't pray like the heathen. With much reputa- you know, use not rep- vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that through they shall be heard from their much speaking. <laughs> That's where the children get it from. If I keep asking mom and dad, eventually they'll cave in and give it to me. The heathen think that about praying to God. If we beg God, somebody won the Powerball. I saw the numbers were down, back down to reality. And I'm sitting there going, somebody was begging God to give them the numbers. And if I ask him enough times, he'll just give them to me so I'll shut up and go away. That's how the heathen think. You guys don't think that way, Jesus says to them. After this manner, verse 9, Therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Now, that's a problem because the kingdom should have already been there. That's like that thing, of, when he says thy kingdom come, that's Deuteronomy 11, where Moses says that the, it'll, be hev- it'll be as heaven... On, um, the days of heaven on the earth, the kingdom comes. Thy will be done on in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Now watch. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Lead us not into temptation. So we're talking and deliver us from evil. He's talking about spiritual things here. He's talking about that lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. The evil here is that the issue of the adversary and the Antichrist specifically. So the evil, uh, come, come over to 1 John chapter 5. Who brings in the evil? That's the question. 1 John chapter 5. So when he says, Father, I'm not, don't pull them out of the world, but protect them and keep them from the evil. It's something very specific. 1 John 5, look at verse, no, verse 18. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. Now, I know what everybody does. They bring that in there, and they say, oh, see, there's the body of Christ, and they start using it on that and so forth, and you know, they, they just butcher it. But notice, whosoever is born of God sinneth not. Verse 19, and we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. If you come back to... Chapter 3 and verse 9 of 1 John. Whosoever is born of God do, doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Well, the question is, obviously they're sinners. They have an advocate in chapter 2, verse 1, with the Father when they mess up. So it's a, notice it's a singular sin. There, there's an issue here that... He's talking about that those born of God will not commit. They can't commit it. 
if you come over back into chapter 5, if you look at verse 16, if any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All, all unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. So you got two sins here, one that's not unto death and one that is unto death. Well, what's the one unto death? Revelation 14, they're told that if they take the mark of the beast, what's going to happen to them? No forgiveness. They just go, march, might as well just march right over there and jump in hell, lake of fire, because that's what's coming. So the sin here is specific. It's not a, well, we live a sinless life. No, it's not that at all. He's talking about the mark of the beast. If they take the mark, now who administers the mark? The Antichrist does. So the evil... That's why he says in verse 19, and we know that we are of God and the whole world lieth in wickedness. That's Ephesians 2, 2 about the course of the world and the children of disobedience. The adversary, the whole world system out there lies under the control of wickedness. The wicked one, the adversary. So when you come back to 17, 15, and he says, hey, I pray not that thou will take them out of the world. Well, why not? Well, because they got a job to do. They're his witnesses. They're going to go represent and have a testimony. They've got the new covenant ministry of the Holy Spirit coming. They've got all the prophetic stuff to fill out, figure out, uh, fulfill and, and get done. And he says, but Father, what I want you to do is protect them from the system, from the evil, from the adversary, from the the evil that the Antichrist is going to produce. Now, if you come over to Revelation 3, the adversary, the attack is on with these folks. Revelation 3. And these are those churches, church messages. Excuse me. Revelation 3, verse number 9. Revelation 3, 9, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. They, but what are they? They're God's people. They, they're Jews, but they're really not Jews. They're going to go over there and they're going to make the covenant with the Antichrist and they're going to fall lockstep right into the program. They're going to have the outward appearance of looking right and doing, but they're really what? They're really, they, they're that mixed multitude and they belong to Satan. Look at verse 10. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil, Matthew 6. That tells you the Matthew 6 prayer is a tribulation prayer. It's a prayer they're going to send, give us some daily bread, provide for us. We, what are we looking for? We want your kingdom to come. That's what, you know, the, the saints behind the altar. How long, Lord? How long are you waiting? Bring it in. Verse, again, verse 10, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. The hour of temptation. By the way, in Revelation, you go over to chapter 17, and you start talking about the ten kings ruling and the ten toes and all that, the, the beast. And what you're, what you're talking about, that's the hour of temptation. He's talking about the 70th week of Daniel. So when you come back to John 17 now, in verse 15... He, when he says here, just keep them from the evil, he's talking about keeping them in that hour of temptation, that, that onslaught of the wicked one. So as Christ is in the moment, 
as Christ is about to go and meet Satan in the hours of darkness and have the culmination of the battle on the cross, he is, that's coming. The, he's going to go to the garden. He's going to be betrayed. He's going to be beaten and so forth. But yet, he's not focused on that at all. Rather, he's focused on these guys who are going to go to a future situation in his absence. And they're going to go into that tribulation, into that 70th week in the time of Jacob's trouble without him, and he knows they're going to need what? Help. They're going to have the Holy Spirit. They're going to have the Father. He's, they've got him too, but they're going to need the help. Verse 16, 17, 16. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. And again, it's talking about, he's talking about the system. They're not a part of the world system. Uh, look over there at Ephesians 2. Uh, I've referenced it a couple times, but this is what, it, this is what we're talking about. He's talking about the, 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 rule, the government, the, the ruling and the reigning and running of things. Uh, Ephesians 2, verse number 1, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So when he talks there about the course of this world, come over to Colossians chapter 1. It's, it's in associated with the prince of the power of the air, and the spirit that's working in the children of disobedience. Colossians 1, verse 13, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. He's translated us from the power of darkness. John 1, it's the darkness that comprehended it not, the wickedness. They're not of the world system, back in 17 of John now. So when he's talking about this, he isn't saying, okay, now they can't go down here to fries and buy food. He's not, that's not what he's talking about. They can't come over here and hop in the Chevy and go to the store. It's, he's talking about we're not in the system. The, Paul, the idea is when Paul in Romans 6, he says, sin shall not have dominion over you, well, why not? For ye are not under the law, but you are under grace. Under, under the control and the, and the authority. They don't belong in the world. They're not of the world. He has excommunicated them from the world. He's already pulled them from the world. So then he says in verse 17, again, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Back to the Holy Father. Sanctify them. Set up, they've been set apart. Father, sanctify them. Set them apart. Keep them from the evil. Keep, they're not to, keep them from being caught up in the world system. Sanctify them. Set them apart. Holy Father, I'm turning them over into your name. Keep them. Sanctify them through thy truth. Come back to Psalms 119. Thy sanctify them through thy truth. Psalms 119. David here in verse number 11. Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. What keeps him from sinning against having the word in my heart. Verse 9, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways? How does a young man clean up? By taking heed thereto, thereto according to thy word. There's David, pretty good advice. Get the word, thy word. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So when you come back to John, Jesus Christ, He is the Word. He's the truth. 
The Holy Spirit carries the title we've seen in chapter 14 there of the Spirit of Truth. So if they're going to get to know the Lord and they're going to get to know the Holy Spirit, then what are they going to have to have? They're going to have to have the Word. So he says, if you flip back to chapter 15, John 15, John 15, verse number 3, Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. What cleaned them up? What's going to keep them? What's going to, what's going to sanctify them? What's going to set them apart? It's going to be the word. So when you come back to chapter 6, again, we... I, when we went, chapter 6, verse 63, when we went through this, I tried to say he's laying in the groundwork here that as he's talking and praying, he's reminding them of it. 663, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the fr- flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. Notice the thing there. The spirit quickeneth, the words, they are what? Spirit, and they are life. That's why in verse 68, Peter's going to say, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. So when you come back to 17, so the Lord is praying to the Father, keep them safe, set them apart, sanctify them, keep them from the evil, keep them from, from... that thing over there in, in Matthew where he says that he shortened the days lest the very elect would be deceived. Keep them, Lord. Keep them. So then he's going to amplify this now in 17, John 17, verse 18. He's going to bring in the great as and so. Verse 18, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. The world. And that's the great as and so. As I went, so did they. Now, come back over with me to Luke 22, because you see something interesting here in Luke 22, which is early in the upper room meeting here. Luke 22, and verse 28, 29, and 30. Verse 28, Luke twenty-two twenty-eight. Ye are they which have continued with me in my temptations, and I appointed unto you a kingdom as my Father hath appointed unto me, that ye may eat and drink at my table in the kingdom and sit on, on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So now watch. What's the Lord saying? As the Father sent me, as the Father gave me a kingdom, as the Father had appointed the Lord to be head of the government of the kingdom in the earth, he then looks to the twelve and says, I'm doing the same with you. Now I give it to you, and you'll be twelve, you'll be sitting on twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. As the Father did for me, so now I do for you. So back here in 17, 18, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. Come back to chapter 15 of John. It's fascinating to me that he just kind of just keeps repeating himself. They're thick-headed, we are too. (laughs) You know, somebody asked me one time, why do you keep going over the same stuff about every other year? Because you're pretty thick-headed, and I can see details that you need to work on, so you need to be reminded. Look at, at, at chapter 15, verse number 9. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. That's why he'll say down there in verse 12, this is my commandment, that ye love one another, as I have loved you. Notice that when we went through this, I told you, everybody gets tripped up on you. Got to love one another. Got to love your neighbor. But he put a clause in there that everybody kind of forgets about. As I have loved you. So when he says here, I, you love me, I love you. 
Again, as and so, as the Father gave me the kingdom, so now I'm giving it to you guys. At, Father, as thou hast sent me into the world. When he sent him into the world, what did he send him in the world to do? To save the lost sheep of the house of Israel, set up the governmental structure. For the second coming, when he's going to use that system and structure to bring in the kingdom. Okay. So now I'm giving it to you guys. So he says in verse 19, And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Sanctify. Set apart. I set apart myself. It's very interesting. And for thy sakes, I sanctify, for their sakes, sorry. By, by the way, back up there in verse 18, as thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. When the Father sent the Son to the world, he came fully equipped, ready to do the job. As they now go and, and be his representatives, representatives in his absence. You know what they are now? Totally equipped to do the job. Because who do they have coming around the corner? They got the new covenant ministry of the Holy Spirit. He's going to write the laws in them. They're going to go and do. He's going to cause them to live. They're going to be right there. Verse 19, sanctify them. Father, I set myself apart to all this so that they could be set apart. Again, he's not, think, he's not looking at what's coming his way in the next couple hours. He's looking down the road. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, and they also, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. The message, the word, all of it, all of the work, all of the laying in of the doctrine that I've given to them. It's designed so that they could be what? Sanctified, set apart. There'd be meat to go in and qualified to go in and, and to do. So then in verse 20, he turns. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. So the shall. He's moving now from the 12, the little flock, there, and he's now going to look to the future. And that's going to be the rest of the chapter. And we won't get through it tonight, but the rest of the chapter, he's going to begin to look to the future. I have prepared them. I've equipped them. They are ready to go. I gave them all. I gave them the word, the love, the commission, the status. I've given it all all to them. And Father, I'm praying that you'll keep them. And that you'll keep them because now I'm going to ask you to keep the ones in the future as well. <laughs> and because when they go now, they shall believe. Verse 20 is, a, is kind of one of those interesting little verses. Neither pray I for these alone. I'm not just praying for these guys that are here but I'm also praying for those that shall believe on me through their word. That's interesting. That means that the word that Peter and the guys go and preach, it's their word, but whose word is it? It's really the son's word, which is really the father's word. One of the things in, I've been, again, trying to get ready for some of the Bible stuff for next year, and I've been reading books, you know, just reading. When I read books about stuff, I don't read every word. I, I pick chapters that I'm after and things, you know. And, and if I read every word, I would never get done because I'm trying, you're trying to consume it, you know. But it's interesting in Scripture, a, a Jewish Bible believer would never go to a new version, if you will. They've been warned in Deuteronomy, in Proverbs, and in Revelation, don't mess with the book. 
And I know what people say about Revelation. Well, that's just the book of Revelation. Yeah, but Deuteronomy and Proverbs aren't. They're about all of it. Okay, Paul warns us in 2 Corinthians not to mess with the book. And so what do we go do? Mess with the book, you know. <laughs> Duh. But they're going to believe on the Lord through what? Their word. Now, if you'll notice, the believing on me. They believe on me. That's the fundamental standard, the foundation for everything. Go back there to chapter 1, verse 11 and 12. What do they do? He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, believed him. How do you receive him? You believe him. To them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. That's the whole focus of John, is to say that it's life in Christ. It's not in you. They're looking to Christ. They, th their, their status and standing and everything that's going on is over there in Christ. Uh, come over to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. It, it's interesting when you come out of the Gospel of John and then you go read 1 John and the Johns and then you go read Revelation, they all have similar, if not the same, theme through them about the truth and the Word and, who the, and where the Word is. But look in Revelation 5. In, in Revelation 4 and 5, you're in the throne room of God the Father. John's been transported up there. And in chapter 5, you have the, the, the seven seals are beginning to be loosened and open, ready to be open. But look at verse 5. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth in all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And what does he begin to do? He begins to open it up. Now you think about the scene. They've looked around and they've asked the question, who is worthy to open the book? And they look around the room and they've looked all down through history and they said there's only one. And that's the lamb that's in the midst of the group. And he's, before he could be the lion of the tribe of Judah, he had to be the lamb. See, back in, in John, hold on to Revelation 5, back there in John 1, in verse 29, John says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. See, before he could be the lion of the tribe of Judah, he had to be the lamb of God. He took care of it. As the lion of Judah, he, he's going to take care of the kingdom. As the lamb, that becomes the basis for which he can be the lion because he took care of the sin of the world. He's the son of David, and he's the son of Abraham. The son of David, there's the lion of the tribe of Judah, the king. He's the son of Abraham, there's the lamb of God. So, Revelation, 9, Revelation 5, he's on the way, in John 17, he's on the way to Calvary, and right in the middle of it, he says, I'm praying for these guys, get them ready, because I'm about to go win the battle that gives them the right now to go out and to do, and gives me the right to give them the authority to go do. Now, look at Revelation 5. Look at verse 9. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, 
out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and hast made us unto our God kings and priests, so there's the fulfillment of Exodus 19, and we shall reign on the earth. Verse 12, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive the power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth, under the earth, and such are in the sea, are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, Blessed and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. <laughs> he won the right to, to all of that because of Calvary. So when you come back to John 17 here, as we begin in verse 20, as he begins now to, I'm going to pray for the ones coming, he invokes the issue of believing on me. Pray, verse 17, 20, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. He brings back around the issue that faith is the issue, period. And it's faith in Him that is the foundation. So in the new covenant ministry of the Holy Spirit, going to work out through the little flock into the nation, the issue is going to be what? Faith in Him. That's why John 3.16, it says what it says. If Those that believe on Him, it's faith in Christ alone. That's the issue in the new covenant ministry with Israel, just as it is with us. But it's been that way since Adam and Eve. So the proposition here that's going to be labeled out now is for them to look to him. What's coming? Tribulation, trouble, issues, sacrificing, sufferings, 70th week of Daniel, time of Jacob's trouble, the great tribulation. And you know what they're going to have to do? They're going to have to look to him. Don't look at ourselves. Because if we look at ourselves, what's going to happen? Well, then we get skittish and we begin to run. They're going to he's, he says they're going to believe through their word. Again, faith is always based on God's word. It's believing what God says to you. Everybody runs to Hebrews 11. Says so there's a definition of faith. There's not, that's not a definition of faith. You know what Hebrews 11.1 1 says? Faith is the substance of, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's what faith does. Faith is simply believing what the Word of God says to you in your time period and in your frame. Their Word. Well, what's here in 17, what's he done to them? Back up in verse 8. When he says their word, well, he's given the word to them, hadn't he? Verse 8, 17, 8, For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Verse 14, I have given them thy word. And the, word, and the world hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am. What did he give them? He gave them the word. And, and he causes them, if you go back there to chapter 14, he knows with the Holy Spirit coming, chapter 14 and verse 26, but the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you, so you're going to have the Holy Ghost in you, and he's going to remind you of the Gospels, chapter 16 and verse 13. When we went through this section, we looked at how he, this is talking about the Hebrew epistles. Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to... Come, 
Hebrews 2, he talks about where are the things uh, we speak of, where are the things to come. So there you have the writing of the Hebrew epistles. They, they, they weren't written there, but the edict that they will be written is given. So when he says they're going to, 1720, he's gonna, they're going to give the word and they're going to be people who believe the word. See? They find the word that's going to give them life and security about getting into the kingdom, and that came from who? came from the Lord. My work's done. The fa- back to the Father. So the progression again, the Father to the Son to the little flock. Then in verse 21, and we'll pick up in this here next time, that they all may be one. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, and they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. That oneness issue is going to come right back up. And again, that oneness, that living for one another, the the life of the Godhead and the deity. And we'll pick up here with that verse in verse 21 and following. By the way, in verse 20, when he talks about, but for them also which shall believe on me, come over to Acts. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter number 1. In Acts chapter number 1, verse number 15, at the end of the verse, they said there's about 120. You see that? Now, that's going to be the leftover group after the cross. Then they get the 12 together. They get their number complete. Then in Acts 2, you have the Holy Spirit fall on them. The day of Pentecost is fully fulfilled. 50 days after Calvary, boom, there it is. It's good to go. Then in chapter 2, Peter stands up, preaches a message, preaches the message out. They ask a question, what do we do? He gives them the prescription to fix their their situation. Then at the end of verse 41, the same day there were added unto them. That's what I want you to see, added unto them, about 3,000 souls. So you start with 120, and then you're going to add in to 3,000, so we're at 3120, okay? Then you follow over into chapter 4, and verse number 4, because Peter's up against it now because of the healing of the lame man in, verse, in, in chapter 3. Verse 4, Howbeit many of them which heard of the word, heard the word, believed. There it is. And the number of the men, now it's just men, were about 5,000. So now if you add 5,000 in there, we're at 8,120. But that's just counting the men. We're, okay, so then you come over to chapter 5. <clears throat> and you've got the event with Ananias and Sapphira, verse 13. And the rest does, does no man join himself to thee, but the people magnified them, and believers were the more added to the Lord multitudes. Now look at that, both of men and women. So multitudes, well, how big is that? Nobody knows. That's a big number. The point is, is in, back in John 17, when he's praying for the little flock and the 12 right there, and then in verse 20, he shifts now to the future group. He's talking about multitudes. And actually in chapter 6, it's so big that the apostles say, or in chapter seven, 6, we need help. And then they, they designate out what everybody calls the first deacons, which is a bunch of malarkey. But then they designated out some additional helpers, one being Stephen and Philip and so forth, because the apostles couldn't do it all. So the group is growing. Okay? So when that's the case, so in verse, back in 1720 here, neither pray I for these also, but for them also which shall... Believe on me through their 
word. The group's going to grow. The Lord knows it. So he's praying, Father, keep them. Keep them as well. Okay? Now, we'll pick up with the verse 21 with the oneness. We'll go back and look in Psalms 133 and so forth where it really begins to be a question about um, the kingdom and a looking at that. But again, if they believe they're in Christ, Christ is in the Father, so the fa- Christ is in them, the Father's in them, and they're going to get the Holy Spirit in them. And the Lord is just simply praying for them to be sanctified, set apart, keep them, protect them, I'm not asking you to pull them out of the world, but rather keep them there, let them go do their job. Okay? All right. Dear Holy Father, we thank you for the evening, Lord. We thank you for your word and for the study thereof and for the look into the details here and to see the plan and the program that you had for your people. In your name we pray. Amen.